Our greatness would not long endure without judges who respect the foundation of faith upon which our Constitution rests. I will take care to separate the affairs of government from any religion, but I will not separate us from the God who gave us liberty. Nor would I separate us from our religious heritage. Perhaps the most important question to ask a person of faith who seeks a political office is this. Does he share these American values, the equality of humankind, the obligation to serve one another, and a steadfast commitment to liberty? They're not unique to any one denomination. They belong to the great moral inheritance we hold in common. They're the firm ground on which Americans of different faiths meet and stand as a nation united. We believe that every single human being is a child of God. We're all part of the human family. The conviction of the inherent and inalienable worth of every life is still the most revolutionary political proposition ever advanced. John Adams put it that we are thrown into the world, all equal and alike. The consequence of our common humanity is our responsibility to one another to our fellow Americans foremost, but also to every child of God. It's an obligation which is fulfilled by Americans every day here and across the globe without regard to creed or race or nationality. Americans acknowledge that liberty is a gift of God, not an indulgence of government. No people in the... No people in the history of the world have sacrificed as much for liberty. The lives of hundreds of thousands of America's sons and daughters were laid down during the last century to preserve freedom for us and for freedom-loving people throughout the world. America took nothing from that century's terrible wars. No land from Germany or Japan or Korea. No treasure, no oath of fealty. America's resolve in the defense of liberty has been tested time and again. It has not been found wanting, nor must it ever be. America must never falter in holding high the banner of freedom. <laughs> These American values, this great moral heritage is shared and lived in my religion as it is in yours. I was taught in my home to honor God and love my neighbor. I saw my father march with Martin Luther King. I saw my parents provide compassionate care to others in personal ways to people nearby and in just as consequential ways in leading national volunteer movements. I'm moved by the Lord's words, for I was in hungered and he gave me meat. I was thirsty and he gave me drink. I was a stranger, and he took me in, naked, and he clothed me. My faith is grounded on these truths. You can witness them in Anne and my marriage and in our family. We're a long way from perfect, and we've surely stumbled along the way. But our aspirations, our values, are the self-same as those from the other faiths that stand upon this common foundation. And these convictions will indeed inform my presidency. To Today's generations of Americans have always known religious liberty. Perhaps we forget the long and arduous path our nation's forebearers took to achieve it. They came here from England to seek freedom of religion. But upon finding it for themselves, they at first denied it to others. Because of their diverse beliefs, Anne Hutchinson was exiled from Massachusetts Bay, Roger Williams founded Rhode Island, and two centuries later, Brigham Young set out for the West. Americans were unable to accommodate their commitment to their own faith with an appreciation for the convictions of others to different faiths. In this, they were very much like those of the European nations they'd left. It was in Philadelphia 
that our founding fathers defined a revolutionary vision of liberty grounded on self-evident truths about the equality of all and the inalienable rights with which each is endowed by his creator. We cherish these sacred rights and secure them in our constitutional order. Foremost, do we protect religious liberty, not as a matter of policy, but as a matter of right. There will be no established church, and we are guaranteed the free exercise of our religion. I'm not sure that we fully appreciate the profound implications of our tradition of religious liberty. I visited many of the magnificent cathedrals in Europe. They're so inspired, so grand, and so empty. Raised up over generations long ago, so many of the cathedrals now stand as the postcard backdrop to societies just too busy or too enlightened to venture inside and kneel in prayer. The establishment of state religions in Europe did no favor to Europe's t churches. And though you will find many people of strong faith there, the churches themselves seem to be withering away. Infinitely worse is the other extreme, the creed of conversion by conquest, violent jihad, murder as martyrdom, killing Christians, Jews, and Muslims with equal indifference. These radical Islamists do their preaching not by reason or example, but in the coercion of minds and the shedding of blood. We face no greater danger today than theocratic tyranny and the boundless suffering these states and groups could inflict if given the chance. The diversity of our cultural expression and the vibrancy of our religious dialogue has kept America in the forefront of civilized nations, even as others regard religious freedom as something to be destroyed. In such a world, we can be deeply thankful that we live in a land where reason and religion are friends and allies in the cause of liberty joined against the evils and dangers of the day. And you can be... <laughs> you can be certain of this. Any believer in religious freedom, any person who has knelt in prayer to the Almighty, has a friend and ally in me. And so it is for hundreds of millions of our countrymen we do not insist on a single strain of religion. Rather, we welcome our nation's symphony of faith. <laughs> Recall the early days of the first Continental Congress in Philadelphia. During the fall of 1774, with Boston occupied by British troops, there were rumors of imminent hostilities and fears of an impending war. In this time of peril, someone suggested that they pray, but there were objections. They were too divided in religious sentiments, what with Episcopalians and Quakers, Anabaptists and Congregationalists, Presbyterians and Catholics. Then Sam Adams rose and said he would hear a prayer from anyone of piety and good character as long as they were a patriot. And so together they prayed, and together they fought, and together, by the grace of God, they founded this great nation. And in that spirit, let us give thanks to the divine author of liberty. And together, let us pray that this land may always be blessed with freedom's holy light. God bless this great land, the United States of America. Thank you.
And there you have it. That's the speech we've all been waiting for. The question earlier this month was, would he give it or would he not? He decided we are